We've already heard a sermon, haven't we? Praise God. I'm thankful. I've always loved to sing. I've always loved music. I've always got help. I've always felt like I was in the presence of God when music was around. It's something how music ministers to you. But it's like the song says, you can sing all the songs you want to and not have Jesus. You, you can sing and, and, and not, you can just put everything you have into it. It's all about the heart. That's what it's about. It's about the heart. Today, well, maybe we're going to talk about that just a little bit because it has to do with the heart. I think everything about the kingdom has to do with the heart. Have you ever had times in your life when you just feel like everything is just ho-hum? Is it, raise your hand if you know what ho-hum means. Raise your hand if you have felt ho-hum. Just in case there were some who haven't raised their hands and maybe when I define ho-hum, you'll raise your hands next time. Ho-hum, routine. When things become routine, boring, dull, so-so, without excitement, without enthusiasm. Now would you say, I've had a ho-hum time? Okay. You know, the Righteous Brothers, <laughs> how many remember the Righteous Brothers? Oh, I even see some young hands up there. Okay. The Righteous Brothers, back in the 60s, sang a song that says, you've lost that love and feeling. Whoa, that love and feeling. You've lost that love and feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Why are things ho-hum? Why are they ho why, why, why aren't things exciting anymore? Why, why are things just seem like they're, they're routine? Why are we not excited anymore? Why are we not stirred up in our heart anymore? Could it be because we've lost that love and feeling? The apostle John in Revelations, he said the same thing just about that that song says, but implied in a different way. When he said in verse 20, verse 2, 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. I like the way the Amplified says it. It, it opens it up just a little bit to our understanding. It says, But I have this, one charge to make against you, that you have left abandoned the love that you had at first. You have deserted me, your first love. He defines what love you have deserted, why you have lost that, have that feeling. You know, John here is, is Paul, I, I think it was, he went to Ephesus. And uh, when he was there, he visited Ephesus. And it's funny how in, uh, in the beginning here, he talks about, uh, just to, let me give you a little background about Ephesus. Ephesus was a major city in Asia, minor. It was a seaport. Uh, it was a location that near the great temple uh, of Artemis, which was one during the, uh, Jesus' time back in the ancient world. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. Paul visited Ephesus uh, 53 A.D., or A.D. 53, that was about 43 years before this, this uh, book, this uh, letter was written. And brought Paul remained in Ephesus for several years, and he preached the gospel, and it was so effective, it drew in the people, and the people accepted what, what he was preaching. And in Acts, the 19th chapter, verse 10, it says that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in providence of Asia, heard the word of the Lord. They didn't just hear the word of the Lord, but they accepted the word of the Lord. They accepted the message, and it grew and it flourished during this time. It was a large city that he brought this, and, and it stirred. Paul's message stirred this large city. Well, Paul, in, in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 4, that we just read, in spite of the many commendations that, uh, that he gives. In this verse right here, it, it, it emphasizes that, that you've lost something. You've lost your, your first love. It's a rebuke. It's a rebuke. And one of the reasons is, is because Ephesus, the, the Christians there, now are, these years have passed, and now they are in the second generation. 
It's a generation after that started to come. And as time has gone on, it's like things have sort of become diluted in a certain way in the hearts of the people. Maybe the, the, uh, the older ones, it got a little diluted, a little diluted, a little diluted, and they didn't emphasize it at home. They didn't pray it at home like they should. They didn't do some of the things that maybe they should have done. And it got down. Well, they, maybe they even kept doing the same things, but they lost that first love is what they did. They were doing the function. They were, they were reading, they were praying, they were obeying these things, but it just wasn't in their heart anymore. That's like going to the grocery store. When, you're, when I was a kid, I used to love to go to the grocery store. I'd get excited. You know why? Because I thought I was going to get some candy. Or I thought I was going to get some ice cream. Or mom was going to buy me something. Well, after a while, it gets to a place where you, what do you have to do? You have to pull the money out of your pocket. You have to pay for it. It doesn't get so exciting then. If we're not careful, uh, you know, we will fade our, our love for God will deteriorate. Why does this walk with God often become ho-hum? That's what I want to talk about. Number one, because it's not new anymore. It's not new anymore. Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember where you were at? Do you remember what was shared with you? Do you remember the scripture? I remember the sermon. I, I, I remember the illustration he gave that he preached around. I remember where it was at. I can still in my mind see the hole in the ground that I dug in underneath an old tabernacle that was sawdust and wishing that I could bury myself in there because I felt like what he was talking about. But where are we now? Have you told your testimony today? Have you told it this week? Have you told it? Do you still even share what God has done for you and how he saved you, how he turned your life around? Do you share that? Are you as excited about it? If you're not excited about it, they're not going to want to hear it. Those that you tell, it still has to be excited. Maybe we, it's become ho-hum. You know, there's a lot of things in the world that become ho-hum. Work becomes ho-hum. Anybody, is your work ho-hum? What happens? Start coming in late. Start taking sick days. Start, our work becomes lacking. We don't put ourselves into it. Do you see some of those things? Can you apply those to maybe the spiritual aspect of our relationship with God and how it becomes ho-hum? Marriages become ho-hum. Stop saying, I love you, honey. How long has it been since you told your wife or husband you love them? In front of somebody, not just while she's asleep at night or he's asleep at night. Start, uh, uh, st st we stop holding hands. When I was in college, or Dr. McDonald was one of the professors there, and I was always so stirred. I, when, him and his, when I saw him, I saw his wife, except in class. They were always walking together. You know what they were doing? They were holding hands. And, and it stirred me so much. And everybody in the school, you could ask them, and they would know, and that's what they would say. That's what they saw in them. Because there was something that was still going in there. There was something they still had in their hearts. There was something that they had to express how they felt. Marriage has become ho-hum. We forget our anniversary. Now, my wife is out of town, probably on her way back. I'm going to tell you a story now, and you can't let her know I told you. Or I'm mud. Okay? We've been married 43 years this, a week ago this past Saturday. 43 years. And I have never forgotten our anniversary. I got up and there was a wedding I had to go perform. And I got up and I got ready and I looked and there's a pack, a box sitting on my counter. And I had received a gift earlier in that box. It was one of these smiley faces. And Suzanne had got me a birthday gift because I'd had a birthday. And so I saw that box and I said, oh, Suzanne's got a present for, for the married couple. And uh, I said, well, I better take it. And I started out the door. She doesn't know this now. You tell I'm dead. I started out the door with it and I got out the car and I thought, no, we're not supposed to bring presents. If, we, if I take a present, if I take a present something nobody else does, that might be, put something on people, they might be embarrassed. So I'm going to leave it home and I'll give it to them at church. And I sat there. 
Well, I go through the day, and finally I come home in the afternoon, and Suzanne says, we do something. And I said, well, you want to go eat? And I said, she said, yeah, that's where you want to go. And she said, someplace different. And I thought, well, why don't we just go where we always go? And she looked at me, and she says, you've forgotten, haven't you? I says, what? Today is our anniversary. Now, here's the story. That gift, I looked over there, and I realized that gift was a gift she got me for our anniversary. Can you imagine what it would have been like if they, I'd have taken that and they would open that up? I would have really, really been in trouble. And you know what? That's a sort of a funny story, but you know, at the same time, it convicted me. It made me question myself. Maybe, maybe I, I, it's become our ho-hum in some ways. And then I started thinking about maybe some other ways that, that we used to express things to each other that I just, you know, you just get wrapped in, and it, it just becomes the norm, and it becomes routine. And God convicted me. Sometimes we take our spouse for granted, don't we? We don't see the things that they have done and do daily. Church becomes ho-hum. Start coming in late to church. Or stop coming. Commitment is lacking. Excuses become more evident. Well, we're so-and-so. Well, they're sick. They're sick. Okay. We're so-and-so. Oh, they're sick. Hmm. You know, neglect is one of the evidence of ho-hum. Neglect. You see yourself neglecting. It has ho-hum. It, it, it's become old. It's just become, and you just neglect. You know, kids, when our kids were young, you could buy them presents, and they'd play with it about a week, you know, and then you'd sit piled up in the corner. Why? Because it wasn't new any longer. It wasn't new any longer. But, boy, you bought a new present, they'd have that, and they'd have that for a certain amount of time. And, then and before long, it's all piled up. You know, I, when I was in college, they're preachers, and, and I don't say this lightly because there's, it grieves me in my heart because there, there were young men there that were called, they felt called to the ministry, and I know God had called them because of the gifts they had, and, and they were so excited about going out, and then when they got out, and it wasn't what they thought it was, and it got old and it got routine and they start selling insurance then or they started selling cars or they started doing this or started doing that and that's what happens a lot of times in our relationship with God our relationships with God lose their shine lose its shine and it becomes ho-hum when does our relationship lose its ho-hum lose its shine it loses its shine when it gets hard when things get hard sometimes, it loses our shine because we don't like to press through certain things. Our relationship with God, when things get hard, it loses its shine. It loses its excitement. It loses, we lose our joy. Why? Because it's hard, and we're having to press. You know, there's a lot of things that we do in life that we press through. Why don't we press through this kingdom stuff? Why do we let it, why do we let it put up walls between us and God or us and other people? Why don't we break through those things? We need to break through when it gets hard. It loses its shine when it's not going our way. You ever lose your shine when things just aren't going your way? I had an uncle that I played uh, checkers with. And we'd play together and play. And there were times when he'd look ahead, he'd see, hey, I'm winning. I was winning. He'd say, well, I don't want to play this no more. Oh, I, this ain't no fun no more. What he was saying was, it, it, saying was that, 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 that he, he, it wasn't going the way he wanted it to. He wanted to be winning. And that's the way it is in our walk with God. Sometimes it don't look like we're winning. It doesn't look like, as a matter of fact, it, it may look like we're losing. When it gets hard, but when it gets hard, what we've got to do is we've got to buckle in and we've got to get out on our knees and we've got to call out to God. And it loses its shine when we can't figure it out. 
we can't figure it out. Anyone know what this is? It's a Rubik's Cube. I appreciate Brian bringing this for me. I uh, see it has the colors on either side. You know how, you know what you do with it? You twist it all up and you try to get it back the way it is right now. And I haven't moved it because I don't know how to do it. I've tried these things and I got in such a place because I couldn't figure it out. I had a, there was a guy that, was, that I was in, uh, uh, in that school that we, when our kids had, our kids used to have these. And they would be out there trying to do like that. And there's this one guy, he, he was doing it one time. He played basketball in our school. And, and he started doing it. He got in such a place, he took that thing and he just threw it against the wall. Because he couldn't figure it out. In our walk with God, there's things you're not going to figure out. You know why? Because it's a walk of faith. There's so many things that we have to just trust God with. We don't have the answers to them. We have to depend upon God. We have to, to trust God and give it to Him. It loses its shine because we haven't learned to stick with anything long enough to get out of it what God has for us. If it's not easy, we don't want to have anything to do with it. If it doesn't taste good, we don't want to have anything to do with it. In our walk with God, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be our taste. There's a lot of different things. My brother loved eggs, but he never would eat a boiled egg. He never would. And I boiled some eggs one time, and I was cooking for our breakfast, and he didn't. He, I'm not eating those eggs. I'm not going to eat those eggs. And I said, yes, you are. He said, no, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. No, I'm not. I says, you watch. I got the eggs. I peeled them. I went in there. I caught him. I put him down. I put my knees on his shoulders. I pried his mouth open, and I stuffed those eggs in his mouth. They're good, aren't they? You like them, don't you? And then he, out in my face. And then he, he goes, well, they're not bad. You know, the thing is, he, 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 he didn't have it in there long enough to really get the taste, you see. And that's the way it is in the kingdom. A lot of times, we, ha we, we have to go through all this, but we got to chew things. There's things we have to do. There's effort that we have to take. And before long, we'll, see, we'll get the flavor out of it. We'll, we'll see what God is, it, it has for us, the blessing that God has for us, if we'll just chew a while. Just chew a while. There was a... Our administrator of our school that we had, his name was Art Clyder, and we would take him out to eat. <laughs> and we would sit there, and we'd be through eating, and he'd be going. We went, to eat a, we went to Dairy Queen one time, and we got ice cream cones. Ice cream cones don't last long, right? We sit there, eat our ice cream, and we're crunching on the cone, and he's going. And it, I, I don't know how long it took, but we sat there, we thought, and we said, and then we realized when he first started, he started, he moved there, and that's the way he ate. He'd chew his food, and he'd chew it, and chew it, and chew it, and chew it, and you want to help him swallow, you know. And, and he, we said something about it one time, how slow he ate, he says, he says, man, I want to get all the juice out of it. I want to get all the flavor out of it. Sometimes we don't, we don't press through. We don't stick to something long enough. Losing our shine. I used to, when I would buy shoes, my mom basically bought our clothes at one place, J.C. Penney's. And I always liked their shoes. I still do like their styles and things. But when we would go buy shoes, they put us on this thing. You put your foot up there, you know, and you'd try on the shoes. After you try on the shoes, say, you want those shoes? Yeah, I'll take those shoes. He'd, the guy would put it in a box. There was a certain guy there that was always there. He'd put it in a box, and you'd open that box up when you got home. You know what you had? Wax. Every time you would buy a pair of shoes, he would put some of that kiwi wax in a little tin in the box with it. And this week, I was thinking about that. 
And, uh, you know, after about four or five months of wearing those shoes, what happens? They've lost their shine. They've lost their shine. Well, see, it's sort of like the way it is with our relationship with God. God does a new thing in our heart, in our life. He gives us a new heart. And it's new, and it's fresh, and it shines. I mean, you feel it. You know it. You know it's there. You feel that. He gives you the new heart. But it's like those shoes. After a while, there's something that has to take place to keep that heart shining. And there's things that we don't do, things that we don't follow through on. You, you, the shine is gone. You say, well, God makes me shine. Well, God does that thing for your heart. But I think there are certain things that we have to do. It's like the we have to take those shoes off. We have to put the wax on. We have to buff those shoes. There's things that we have to do. And a lot of those things, like I talked about before, was getting down on your knees, getting low. You know, to polish shoes, sometimes you have to get down and, and polish. You ever seen these guys get used to polish shoes? I see one every once in a while. They'll get down and they'll polish somebody. They've got to get low to polish. Sometimes we've got to get low on our knees to get the shine back in. When things become, come whole home and we lose our shine, it's because we haven't applied or obeyed what he has given us to keep our hearts shining. Lamentations. You know, God is constantly giving to us what we need to shine constantly we, we're not even aware of it sometimes oh, this morning he's just thrown out all kinds of things as we were worshiping i was thinking about it i could almost see god throwing things out to us to help make us shine to help our our, our countenance to be bright in this dark world lamentations 322 says the steadfast love of the lord never ceases God's love, his steadfast love, that means it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. His love for you never ceases. Even when you do him wrong, even when you sin against him, everything against him, he still loves you. Who loves you like that? Who cares for you like that? His mercies never come to an end. There's a, a scripture that, that, that the psalmist David has written, his mercy endures forever. His mercy, he says, his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. I think we've done that, haven't we, in the scripture? His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. It never stops. God's mercy is to help us shine. That mercy, that love and that mercy is to help us shine. They are what? New every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. His faithfulness. His faithfulness helps us shine. We're not bored because God's changed. We're not unfulfilled because he stopped working and being involved in our life. The problem is we need to start showing up in our relationship. If we lose our shine, it's because he hasn't. Okay, that, that, you know, losing our shine, it's like when we come in, and the pastor or minister or whoever evangelist preaches, if we don't apply to ourselves what he has given us to make us shine, it's never going to shine. We have to apply what God gives us for us to shine. Another reason things become ho-hum is something else has taken its place. It looks better. It looks better. It's got a better shine. David had a heart after God. Scripture, Acts 13, 22, it says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Later on, David, after he... Uh, is anointed the king, and Saul is still king, but in, in the sense of the physical, but really, according to God, David was already the king. Well, Saul, I mean, David comes and he, he gets ready to face Goliath. And, and, and what, what, when he's, he says, he, he sees what's going on here, and he, he thought, 
you know, I'll do this. I'll, I'll, I'll fight the giant. I'll come up against the giant. I want to read in 1 Samuel 17, 25. It says, now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out, the giant Goliath? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. Give great wealth to the man who kills him. David's hearing this. He, all, he will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. See, what happens is a lot of times it, it, it is the enemy will try, and of course, Saul, they weren't the enemy, but the world will try to give us something to take the place of what God has for us. He'll give you an imitation. He'll give you something else. He'll give you something that looks good. He'll give you something that seems satisfying. He'll give you something that you enjoy, something that you can do good. But it'll take you away from the kingdom. It'll take you away from God's people. It'll take you away from God's voice to where you can't hear God's voice, where you can't hear anything, where you're numb. Where My uncle's my mother's youngest two brothers had hound dogs, black and tan and blue tick and walkers. And, and I remember as a young boy, I was about eight years old, that he would, they would take me out. My dad was sick, couldn't take me hunting. So they would take me hunting, squirrel hunting, deer hunting. And, and so we were out hunting, and these dogs were out hunting deer. And we're out there, and all of a sudden the dogs, one dog, he starts, starts barking, and he takes off running. And when he takes off running, one of my uncles says, that's Jake, that's Jake. They could tell who was who by the way they were. That's Jake. He's taking the lead again. Jake's after him. And then boo, 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 all of a sudden, and you know what would happen? Back here on this side, you'd hear, that's Molly, that's Molly. And he'd go through, and, and there was about five of the dogs, and you could hear them all going together, chasing. And then I remember one time was out there, and Don, my, the youngest brother, he said, oh, oh, man, that old Jake, that old Jake. He's not running after a deer. He's after a rabbit. He's after a rabbit. And it just, you know, and, and what he was saying is this. He's not a rabbit dog. He's not a beagle. Jake was a black and tan, and he was made to run deer. You see, some of us, God's called us, and we have a calling on our life, and we have gifts that God's given us, and we've chosen something else. We're chasing rabbits. And God wants, to, wants us to chase deer. We're going after this. We think, oh, we're doing something. Oh, and rabbits are good. Rabbits are good to eat, but, and, and, and they're good to hunt, but when God has something greater for you, when you have a greater purpose and you deny that, Oh, what you're missing. You know what? Jake took off after the rabbit. Molly and Blackie and Lom and Abner. They followed. What does that tell you? They were chasing a rabbit too. Why were they chasing a rabbit? Because Jake was chasing a rabbit. And they thought that's how you know, there's going to be people that are going to follow you, and you don't know they're following you, but they're in the same pack you are. And if, if you chase rabbits, you know what they're going to do? They're going to follow in right behind you. Your children are that way. Whatever you're chasing in life is what they're going to chase too. Wherever they're, mm, there's a lot of things right there. Let me give you one last reason things become ho-hum. It's because of the influence of the wickedness around us. Because of the influence of things around us. Things. Matthew 24, 12 says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of a most will grow old. Because of the increase of wickedness in our world, that love, that, that godly love will grow old. That love that we're talking about, that, that love that was being talked about in the Scripture, Scripture and, and Revelation will become grow, grow cold. And it won't be the same kind of love. Just like the, the church at Ephesus, when, when they, he was speaking to them, he was trying to tell them, 
your love, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but, but, but your love ain't what it used to be. Matthew, you know, Satan offered Jesus the world. Satan did. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit in the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command the, his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not point, put the Lord your God to the test. Then he says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you would bow down and worship me. You see, that's, that's what that's, the devil's doing that to people today in our world. God has this beautiful, this, this God that we've been singing about, this God that seems like sometimes when I sing, I feel like my chest is, is going to burst. There's no way to express it. You can't sing it loud enough. You can't put enough in it. You know, I, I look up and see our instruments. They're, they're doing all they can just to worship the Lord. You just, we, it's like you just can't do enough of it. The world is, Satan and the world is throwing things in front of us, uh, in front of our life. What are you letting influence you? I figured some would. This week, I love to fish. Uh, you know, every, everyone needs something that they can get near God and just get things off of them and let God speak to their heart and just sometimes just a space of grace where God can just encourage you with his nature and bless you. Or so I went fishing this week and I'm out there fishing, and God spoke to my heart about some things and, and the influence that the enemy has and the influence the world has on us. You know, the devil has a whole bag of lures. And you don't have the time to show me, for me to show you what's in this bag. But I'll show you just one That's just one crankbait. That's a deep diving crankbait. You see, the devil, what he does, he's just like this. He has, he has in there, he knows that people are different. He has this GPS, and he scopes people out. He, he, realize, he knows how deep they are. There's some that will strike at a, something real shallow. And then there's some that will sort of a, you know, a, a two foot under the surface, just below the surface in their experience with God. The devil knows it's going to take that right there. And then he knows that, you know, that, that's like we were out there fishing, and, and I started throwing this. You know what this is? I know some of you guys do. What's that? That's called a rattle trap. That bait, when it comes through the water, it does this little shake, and it's got this, hear that right there? Rattle like that. You know, there's some things that, that, that the enemy brings by you, Ben, that shake Rattle and roll. True? And you know what? If you're not careful, it has these little barbs in it that'll hook you. That'll pull you in. That'll suck you in. That's what happens with that. Have you ever seen a fish? Have you seen it on TV? You know, they just don't go like that. But they have gills. And these gills open up and they're in the water. And they actually suck that bait in. They don't just always hit it but it'll suck it in and they let that water flow through their gills 
And as it does, it pulls that bait in their mouth, then they bite down on it. I tried that bait. It didn't work. I, I tried this bait here. This is called a fluke. It's something that looks like, guess what? A minnow. Can you see it? You ought to see that thing coming through the water. It darts here and darts here, and, it, and it'll just, when it gets in the water, it'll just lay, lay there, and it'll just sort of sink down, and then they say, oh, I've got it now, and whammo. You see, it's something that looks like something that it's not. And that's the way the devil does, too. He shows you things that aren't what you think they are. It might be a man. It might be a woman. It might be a, a, a situation. It might be a circumstance. It's not what you thought. That's why we have to stay close to God. That's why we have to, to listen to God's voice. And then th there's times that, that, you know, does anybody know what this is? One of my favorite baits. That's a spinner bait. Now, who would think a fish would bite that? Who would ever think a fish? That looks like, what do you call it? Those pins where you, that you put on diapers, what, what kind of pins are those? Sa that looks like a safety pin with, with a little fuzzy thing on the end with two little shiny things. You know, the world will bring things by that, that don't look, but they're shiny. They're shiny. You know, th these are silver, but some of them have gold, or some of them have silver and gold, uh, both of them. You know what the enemy will do? Sometimes he'll have silver and gold come by, and that's your God. That's your God. Oh, you wouldn't admit it. And that, that's shiny. Oh, he gets your attention. And that's what you give your life for, is that silver and gold. Something that one day, you, what you do, you know what you do? You buy a new car, and you pay uh, 35, 45, 55, 65, 100, 100. I mean, you go on up, depending on what you get, what you want to put on it. Starts for about 12 and goes on up probably, maybe lower than that now. You get it and you keep it for, what, five years? If you don't wreck it, if you wreck it, where is it? In the junkyard, rusted, all that. You see, everything in this world is going to turn to dust and rust. It's important that we look for things. And that's the way the enemy works. Finally, we fished and fished and fished and we... we I caught one on the spinner bait, but that, that was all I caught. It was a, 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 a brim, I mean a white perch. Finally, I put this on. Bill Hollum, y'all know Bill Hollum? This is his favorite bait. He goes to Lake of the Pines, and I'm telling secrets now. He goes to Lake of the Pines, and it's a brush called a brush hog. And he takes it, it's called watermelon red, and he dips the tail, see how yellow it is, and, and, and in a dip that has garlic on it and it's a stain and it stains it yellow and he takes that booger out there and i put the, I, you know what i told i told michael i was fishing with my pastor michael i said well i'm just going to get bill holland's old old bait and i put that booger on there and threw out there wham it bent over pulled him in wham hey, michael said you might want to throw me one of those a wham there's three right right in a row you know what this bait does you throw it, and it goes down to the bottom. And as you reel it in, you can present it to where you can sort of move it a little bit. It doesn't do like in water. And or you can just let it lay there, and they'll hit it sometimes. But, but what depth is it, is it? It's when it's on the bottom. It usually, if you have a weight on it, it goes to the bottom. To the bottom. You know, the devil knows when you're at the bottom. He knows when you're at the place, the ho-hum place. And there's a lot of big fish on the bottom, especially in the summertime. Sometimes the bottom is the ho-hum place. And we're lying around. Those fish are just doing nothing. And you can pull that bait. Sometimes you can pull that bait right over them, and they won't do anything. But there's times you can pull it where you can really see it well, and, buddy, they'll nail that thing. They'll nail that thing. David was a man who loved God. We read that earlier. Had a heart after God. He lost his first love. He lost his first love.
We know the story about David. He stayed home when he should have been in the battle. He thought, nah, I just take a break. He's supposed to be in the battle. I want to tell you something. If you're not in the battle, there's a chance the enemy can overcome you. As a Christian, we have, we're always in the battle. You always have to be alert and aware. See, he wasn't. And he walked out one day, and this thing that just looked so good. I mean, you know, he only had a whole bunch of other wives. But this was just seemed like it was just, and it happened to be someone else's wife. He committed adultery, ended up taking, having the life of her husband taken to try to cover it up. I know a man, two a man, who, we talk about staying home from the battle, who was a man of God, and he stayed home to watch the Super Bowl and didn't go to church. True story. Ended up committing adultery. Just because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because he stayed out of the battle. Should have been preaching. Stayed out of the battle. When he was supposed to be in the battle. Conclusion. That song that I sang says, You've lost that love and feeling. You've lost that love and feeling. The last part of it says, bring back that love and feeling. Whoa, that love and feeling. Bring back that love and feeling because it's gone, gone, gone. Maybe this is where you are this morning. You've lost that love and feeling. You've lost that passion in your heart. Paul said, John said, Revelation said, God is no longer your first love. When relationship with God becomes ho hum, we don't need to back away. That's what we do. It's almost like when we it gets ho hum, we think, "Well, I'm free now. I can do certain things. I can go here. I can do that." And it's a trap in our life. When go, when God's when that happens, we don't, we're not to back away. We need to press toward the mark. Paul said that. He says, I press toward the mark. We have to press toward that mark. When love for God becomes dry and parched, that's when we need to dig in. That's when we need to get in the Word more. That's when we need to pray more. That's when we need to not miss church. That's when we need to... When, when you're in a battle, when you're in a street, that's when you need God's people. That's when you need to be around that type of people. In 2 Kings, the third chapter, three kings had three armies. And they gathered together against Moab to battle. Now, this wasn't a problem. They could have overcome Moab, but the only re problem was they didn't have any water. They didn't have any water. They were without water. God had held back the rain. So these kings finally were forced to stop the progress that they were making. They find that the battle has got to cease because of no water. Then the, they start talking and, and they ask the king, say, what, what do we do? What do we do? And the king says, says, is there a prophet with you? Is there a prophet there? Well, it just so happened there's this guy who used to Bring Elijah, take care of Elijah. His name's Elisha. I think he's here. He was sort of an understudy of Elijah. I think he's here. So they go to the prophet, Elisha, who said, his words were, call a little louder. Your God probably is gone hunting or fishing. Sort of what the way he put it. Pursuing, pursuing something else. Call a little louder. So Elisha, then he said, what did he say? He says, bring some music. Bring some music. Now, wait a minute. 
you're asking for music and we're in there's a battle here that has to be won bring some music they brought the music the music starts playing and then in verse 15 of second kings 3 it says but now bring me a, a harpist while the harpist was playing the hand of the lord came to elijah and he said this is what the lord says i will fill this valley with pools of water for this is what the lord said you will see neither wind nor rain yet the valley will be filled with water and you your cattle and your other animals will drink and what he told them to do he told them what they needed to do is go in the valley and dig ditches dig ditches you know how much water they had well let's see what happens if you keep on digging ditches if you dig in if you dig in with god and you just keep digging it may take a while and there may be a few clouds come over and it doesn't just quite but eventually it's going to rain because it says the next morning about the time of offering of the sacrifice there it was water flowing from the direction of edom and the land was filled with water you know what they had as much water as they dug ditches that's how much water they had if they hadn't have dug they wouldn't have had and that's it when we're in that dark when we're in that whole that whole hum place and when when things don't feel right dig dig in dig because god's going to come in and he's going to bring that living water and he's going to bring that life that seems like you're lifeless and you're dried up and you're parched spiritually he's going to bring that water and it's going to be like a sponge soaking it up and it's going to fill it up you ever seen a sponge that's real dry they're about that size you can get them wet and they just sort of open up that's the way we'll be god will fill us completely let's thank the lord for his word tonight this morning maybe your relationship with god has been ho-hum and you would like to say god maybe